now we're going to begin the meeting. I would like to welcome everybody here today in our viewing audits to the December 10th uh, meeting of the City Davenport Zone Board of Adjustment. Your participation in city government is appreciated and welcome. If you have a mobile device, please turn it off as it may interfere with the room's electronics. My name is Jim Reistoffer, Chairman. To my right is Lynn, and to my immediate right, if we're following right, is Dan. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Present is Scott Coops uh, from uh, Planning, and... Laura Berkeley, the De Development and Planning Administrator. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> the Zoning Board of Adjustment is a five-member judicatory board established by state law. We are appointed by the mayor and confirmed by city council to serve without compensation for a five-year term. The board meets twice a month to hear appeals involving hardships from stiff application of current zoning laws. We also grant special uses and rules on administrative appeals. Are there any corrections to the meetings from the last meeting? Okay, seeing none, ask for a motion for approval. I'll make a motion to approve. Okay. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passed. Any old business? Uh, I see none. <clears throat> um, um, so oh. like, when you announced who was here, you, you mentioned, you, I think you forgot to mention Tom Quinn, but is uh, Lynn, are you there? No. Okay. Guess not. Okay. So we got four members, right? Scott. Yep. Okay. New business. Scott, you want me to read the? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Request SU 20 08 of Jonathan Carson's on behalf of Atomic Coffee at 3919 West Locust Street for a special use to approve a drive through facility. The property is zoned C1 neighborhood <coughs> commercial district. Section 17.08.020. Table 17.08-1 of the Denver Municipal Code requires a special use for a drive-through facility on property zone C1. Staff? Scott Copes, uh, planning. Um, this request is here today uh, because our, our new code requires drive-throughs to have additional scrutiny because they, they have there's certain conditions that can cause problems when uh, when you're placing a, a drive-through in a, a C1 area and some of our other areas uh, and also in general just all of our new drive-throughs have uh, use standards which they must meet uh, next slide please uh, we did send out notices to 200 feet uh, we have not received anything in uh, in comments back uh, next slide. <coughs> um, so this is the site here. Um, it's going to be next to this existing driveway. This is a shared access driveway that goes all the way back for three lots in addition to this lot. It's also shared for the, the businesses that are over to the east of that location. Um, this shows the, the lot. Um, it's a long, narrow lot. It's 77 feet wide and uh, 300 feet deep. It has 10 foot easements on all sides except for the rear. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this shows what is being proposed. Uh, it's, a, it's only 13 and a half feet by 50 feet long. It's 300, uh, 375 square feet. Um, this is the front here. The, that just shows the windows and then the windows uh, on the two sides are the windows for the drive through. And then this front is just windows that would be facing the street. Uh, to meet our 50% transparency requirement. Um, the door to the facility is on the south side, which would be to the rear or on the opposite side of the street. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this shows um, their site as far as the site plan they've submitted, showing vehicles and also showing landscaping. Next slide, please. This is... Um, a little bit more zoomed in view. Um, so there are a few issues, there are a few things that of note. Um, the east driveway, um, or the east drive through, 
is only 15 feet wide uh, and our code requires a 10 foot um, drive aisle and a nine foot um, drive through lane. Uh, so the bailout lane has to be 10 feet and the existing drive lane has to be nine. So they're four feet short there. Um, they, they show us 13 spaces here. Um, if I go to this uh, next slide, please. And then, so this is a zoomed in view. Um, so you can see they're near bumper to bumper here as they're lined up. And um, they, it is diagrammed out there, it's um, 19 feet per car is what they're using for stacking. Um, this, this business has two other businesses uh, in the Quad Cities. There's one in Davenport and one in Bettendorf. Um, we, we looked at those. We've got police photos from Bettendorf and we also have air photos from the internet. Um, those those uh, sites are closer to 22 to 20, 23 feet uh, as far as what's needed for stacking. And that's just how drivers, drivers naturally drive. Um, at the uh, Bettendorf site, they were backed all the way up to Belmont Road. And even at that much congestion, they were still using over 22 feet for stacking. So even when they, even when drivers know there's a premium of space, they still take about 22 feet. Uh, next slide, please. And so this is exhibit A, which was in your staff report. Um, staff asked, or actually our traffic our transportation engineer who is online, if we have any questions, he can answer any questions. And I may have him chime in here in a little bit. Uh, Gary Statz is online with us. Um, but so that we asked them to provide peak demand information and um, so we can have an understanding about what kind of level of service they're gonna have and what kind of stacking that they might need. Um, but, so in their letter back to us, uh, they, they let us know that the most comparable site would be the Atomic Coffee in Bettendorf. Uh, that's on uh, Cedar Ridge or something. I'll, I'll see the name later, but um, they also, yeah, they also let us know the uh, the peak demand is only going to be 10 vehicles, worst case. Um, and so that was what was submitted to us by the petitioners. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so as I kind of got into a little bit here, there are some issues, um, stacking of vehicles. Um, if they have stacking similar to some of their other sites, could very well have uh, traffic backed up onto Locust Street. And in a minute, I'll get into more details about these other sites. Um, our transportation planner, our city engineer, both recommended against it. Um, Gary, do you want to add anything about uh, your recommendation? Um, you've kind of summarized it pretty well. So, yeah, my main concern is if they have uh, traffic comparable to their Bettendorf site, which has side street traffic comparable to West Locust, um, there's going to be, with this site, there's going to be traffic waiting in West Locust. That's my biggest concern. Okay, thank you, Gary. Um, stay, stay in uh, touch with us. Let me talk to you again. Um, so that's the information we got back from our transportation planner and city engineer. Uh, again, I mentioned the the 15 foot that they have for the east drive through, and when they need 19. Um, and again, they so they 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 told us the the best site for us to compare was the Bettendorf site. Now the Bettendorf site uh, on a Saturday. Um, they had vehicles taking up over 838 linear feet of stacking. Um, the site that they're proposing here today only has 243 feet of linear for stacking. Uh, so as you can see, if that's a comparable, there's going to be a, a concern because that kind of traffic would easily be on Locust Street. Uh, next slide, please. And so this is our exhibits B and C from the packet. Uh, on the left side is um, the Bettendorf site. Um, on this air photo, there's only 16 cars shown. Um, but as I, you know, in the next couple slides, I'll show you some more information showing you the, the 37 that was shown when the police took the photos. Uh, so on the right is the Davenport site, and that has 27 cars shown. Uh, next slide. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Um, so the photo on the top left here, this is Belmont Road where this burgundy card is. Uh, and that's the end of the 838 feet from 
Well, he combined both the east lane and the west lane. Um, that's how you get the 8300 or the 838 feet. Uh, these other photos here, uh, this is taken directly from, uh, I think there's a bank or so on the other side. So you see the people waiting in line to get in for the west drive through. You can also see in the background the people that are waiting in line to get through the east drive through. Uh, the bottom photo on the other, on the right hand side, that's taken from the north facing south. And so that shows the cars wrapping around and going through the west facing drive through. Uh, and this photo here in the top right uh, shows you what's in front of this picture here that what, how many cars. So I've taken these four photos and I've counted the number of vehicles in there. And so there's 37 cars waiting in line at that time. Uh, next slide, please. And so here's a comparison of the, the drive-throughs. Um, so what, what they proposed is 243 feet long. Bettendorf, from the police photos, they were utilizing 838 feet. And from the air photo that we saw online, the Davenport, the Brady site had 640 linear feet being used for stacking. Um, so the proposed site, allows for 13 cars max. If, if they're really tight, you could probably get 13 on there, bumper to bumper. Um, Bettendorf from the police photos we were showing, this is just one time. It's not, we don't know if it's the worst time they ever had or if it's a normal time or less than normal, we don't know. But just a one Saturday when they went out, uh, there was 37 vehicles there. And in Davenport, the air photo that we saw earlier had 27 photos or 27 vehicles in both the drive through lines. And getting back again to the stacking space length, again, they're proposing 19 feet per vehicle for stacking. Uh, the Bettendorf site had 22.6, Davenport site had 23.7. That Davenport site's a really large parking lot, so it, you know, I think the reason that one's a little bit higher is because the people out there know they have enough room, so they're not quite as tight. Uh, next slide, please. So, what we've seen is that this site, uh, as it's designed, doesn't have enough stacking. Um, staff went through and figured out what, what would it look like if you had enough stacking to provide for 35 vehicles or 36 vehicles or whatever. Um, the biggest thing that almost always has to happen is you need to have the site have a lot of frontage um, so that you're not um, backing out onto the, the street. And so in this example of a possible to, way to do it, you could come in for one drive through and wrap around and the other drive through would go straight in. And there's a common uh, bailout line or exit lane between the two. Uh, and then the, the other drive through wraps around, bailout line wraps around and then they can exit. Um, the other thing of note is, and, and another request, um, the petitioner is asked to have a building out of the build two zone. Um, so this shows, you know, if there was a retail building or a office building built in the build two zone, they would be allowed to have a building behind that and they wouldn't uh, need a hardship variance for their build two issue. And so that's just a, a possibility of what, um, what it could look like. The next slide, um, so this shows the existing site. Um, there, this, this is the lot they're proposing to build. It's, it's right there. It's 77 feet wide, but the same owner that owns this lot they're willing to purchase is, or lease, I don't know which it is, it's purchase, I believe. They, there's 229 feet here owned by the same owner. So on the next slide, I show that it, it, that site would fit there. Um, there are, there is a hundred foot easement through here for uti over here, utility lines. And so there is enough room to get the building outside of that easement. Um, so anyway, that's an example of what it would look like and what it would take to get the vehicles not backing up onto um, West Locust Street. Now, that's, we're not saying this is the best option. We're not saying it's a preferred option. It's just a, an option of what, and what it would look like. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so then we get into our findings. Um, you know, as we looked at the information that the traffic engineer and the transportation planner gave us, uh, and we're looking at the impact of people backed up, or vehicles backed up onto the street. Um, 
So uh, the number one is, or the number one is approval standard states that uh, the establishment or maintenance and operation uh, will not endanger public health, safety, or welfare. Uh, and of course, if we have vehicles stacked up into the street, that's going to be an issue. Um, the next slide is number two. The proposed special use is compatible with the general land use and adjacent properties and other property within the immediate vicinity. Um, so is it possible to have a drive-through in this area and not impact other business? It's possible. That's what we've shown on the alternative plan. It just takes a lot more land than what they're showing here. But as they propose this, there would be a negative impact on um, the adjacent properties. And in the next slide, the third criteria, uh, the special use in specific location proposed is consistent with the spirit, intent, and, or and ordinance of this adopted land use policy. So um, C1 is a um, a district that doesn't have a lot of high intensity uses. It has um, offices and um, things that are more transitional and more compatible when they're adjacent to residential. Now, the scale of a coffee shop that has the traffic of maybe the coffee shop on Brady where there's three or four cars in a row, something like that would be compatible with this area. Uh, something of this size where it's impacting adjacent property owners, blocking uh, lots to the south that are undeveloped, blocking lots that are to the east, uh, there is an impact there. And so in, in all these three cases, uh, the staff does not feel that the criteria have been met. And um, accordingly, our recommendation, recommendation is for denial. And you can go to the next slide. Yeah. And if you have any questions, if the board has any questions, I can answer those. Do the board members have any questions for staff? Uh, nothing for me. The presentation was well done. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Thanks. Yep. <clears throat> Is the applicant here? Yes. You want to come up and present your case? Or? I can. Um, we're we going to have Jonathan do a little bit of talking first. Yeah, um, Jonathan Carson is on the meeting, um, so he could speak over the phone. Uh, to start okay. the uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. Could you give us your name, please? My name is Jonathan Carson. I'm a project manager at Streamline Architects, and I've been working with the, the petitioner for this project in its entirety. Evidence here today. Scott, Scott has done a pretty thorough rundown of what the project is. This is a two way drive through coffee shop. There are similar setups around the area with uh, the same concept, which is quick serve coffee, energy drinks, and other assorted. Items. This proposed site is designed for drive-through. At least it looks in the way it was laid out for drive-through to be put in this location. Whether it was a coffee shop, a McDonald's, a fast food, this was kind of separated out to look like it would facilitate that that type. We had looked into this and developed what we believe is a thorough um, setup to accommodate as many cars as the site that's there is capable of handling. This site, while adjacent to another large parking lot and future development, could be used as extra stacking space. So that's the way we kind of looked at this. This, the large parking lot to the east would be comparable to the way it's set up at Brady, where you have lots of extra space to stack extra cars. We thought that would be a viable option to alleviate some of the concern. And we also have that long shared access driveway that is not supplying anyone at this moment, but 
it has the capability of handling another 300 feet of cars at this point. The petitioners have had conversations with the adjacent property owner on potentially doing this. I believe that the real estate agent had talked a little bit about doing this as well. We would like this considered just based on the fact that we have accommodated as much space as possible in this in this arrangement. And I'm sure we can have a discussion about some of these concerns. And I'm sure there are more questions and comments that you'd like to have. And we've thought of a lot of different ways to try to handle this. And we're open to answering any of those questions. So I would like to I'd like to add on to what Jonathan Sir, oh. you want to do it. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, Peter Shalasi. We're, we're, we're getting the commissioners to, oh. if, if they ask some questions for, for Jonathan, then we'll get you. Okay. Okay. Commissioners, do we have any questions for Jonathan? No. So, Angie Levi, so Jonathan, you're saying that if you have more cars there, you'd be willing to purchase more property to add the extra spaces? That would be a question for the owner. The lot that we have available to us right now is what is shown on that slide there. That's what we have access to right now. So we we can only provide you with information based on what we have access to. We could answer, I mean, we can see that more cars can stack there within the shared parking area and the, and the shared driveway area. But in our petition, we can't actually say that because we don't have that land. That's the shared land. The project scope is that, that piece of land right there. Okay, thank you. Any other commissioners have any questions for Jonathan? Seeing none. Hey, Sir, do you want to? Oh, you must be going next. Oh, yes. You want to give us your name? Yes. Yeah. Is it okay if I take my mask off? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Hi, my name is Scott Ward, uh, CEO of Point Builders. We're working with the uh, client on the project design and construction. So we got some insight I'd like to share with you. And, uh, Appreciate the feedback from Scott and, and staff. Um, a couple things I want to note. Um, one, there are no objections uh, from any neighboring properties, so I think that's important for us to note. That's that's uh, a big deal. Uh, two, the bailout lane, the four feet short. Um, I, maybe that was an oversight on our part. I think that's easily correctable to add that four feet additional lane there. So um, I think that's easy to overcome. Um, I do have in the in the packet. It talks about the drive-through use standard 17.08.030.j, which specifies stacking spaces, four spaces in line, 18 feet long minimum. Um, we have 13, and they're 19 feet plus. So according to that particular line, we meet that. Um, also, we talked a little bit, I'm a little bit jumbled here, but we talked a little bit about serving high schools and what the customer base is going to be here. The Atomic Coffee at Bettendorf really serves two high schools. Bettendorf is very close and PV is very close. The uh, clientele for these, um, these places tend to be high school students uh, as a, a pretty good portion of that. Um, so if you take the total mass of Bettendorf and Pleasant Valley, it's um, significantly higher than what West High School is, which is in proximity to this. So we think that less traffic because of that clientele base is less. Um, the other thing to consider, um, there's a customer dilution effect. Just because they add a third atomic doesn't mean they're gonna add 50% client base. You're gonna get some dilution from other locations. So Brady Street might be relieved, Bentner might be relieved. I know kids that personally drive over from Illinois to get these atomic coffees. They're, they're really good if you haven't had them by the way. Um, so I'd just like to consider that. Um, also, if you could flip back to the site plan real quick, just want to make a note. Yeah, so what Jonathan's talking about, when you turn into this, there's the shared access paving, and you can see we extended the access um, section by 1,400 square feet there towards the end, and that's to get us farther back to gain more stacking. So we've already committed to that expense to help improve this potential situation. But you have, when he says we have that 300 feet, 
from the entrance drive all the way to that where the paving is, we, none of that is counted in the stacking. And overflow will stack there, so there's probably another 10 plus cars that could potentially be in just that drive lane, not impeding anybody else, either for this facility or any adjacent facility. So we, we didn't show it because it's not on this parcel, but um, there, there's a potential for a lot more stacking there as well. Um, I, I, we, as we do appreciate the potential site plan that could be with, we showed that we showed the site turned the other way on that property. There's a couple negatives to that. One, all that property that comes now south of that becomes, uh, it loses value. This wants to be behind this, right? So there's, you're devaluing some of that property. So what's going to happen is that seller is going to say, you don't get that front part, you got to buy the whole thing. And if we have to buy that much property, it's going to be cost prohibitive. And this won't be a job, quite frankly. So I appreciate that feedback and potential. Not feasible in this situation, in my opinion. Um, I'm sorry, let me get my notes here. So I, I, I guess my case here is I, I think... Uh, we meet the, the stacking requirements are four or 13 plus maybe 10 depending on how you want to look at this so it's 23 i think some of the uh, i'm sorry one question we did have the pictures that were presented in bettendorf we think those might have been taken during a shutdown when some of the competing coffee shops were shut down there was a time when atomic was the only shop open because they were complying with the standard they decided to do that so traffic was driven there I'm not saying that was the cause of that it's potential i don't know the date of those um, those pictures, but that's a possibility. But if you go there, that's not a typical situation of 37 cars in there. I mean, we know how many transactions take place at those facilities, and we share that information. And, and if you do the math over those times, we think our pro projections are accurate in, in those situations. Um, so I hope you take that into consideration. That's ends, ends my comments. Thank you. I think. I'll think of something else probably. Do you have any questions? Not this time. Scott, I have a question for you. What, yes. Maybe you don't know the answer, but what is the traffic count up there on Locust Street? Uh, Gary would have that. It's uh, similar to the, it's actually higher than the one at um, Bettendorf is my understanding. But yes. Gary, are you there? Uh, Gary, you're on mute, so if you uh, unmute it, then we'll be able to hear you. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I had to unmute. You're right. I had to unmute. Um, approximately 12,000 a day, just off the top of my head, somewhere around there on West Locust. Gary, do you consider this a high-volume street in the city of Yeah, fairly high volume. It is only a three-lane road with a two-way left turn lane, so there's so if anyone is waiting on Locust, you've basically blocked the road. We have another gentleman who wants to present. Yes. Uh, you want to give your name, please? Yes, uh, Peter Shalasi, owner and operator of Atomic Coffee Bar. Um, so just going back to the car stacking and the standards that we're being held to with 37 cars um, for that Bettendorf example, those are police photos because that was an isolated incident. Um, I know they weren't dated, but I do know that during the peak of the pandemic, our business was the only one that was still operating when all the other coffee shops in town, Starbucks, um, you name it, they were closed for about five days. So the police came and took photos of this because this was a sight to see. There was, we, we were the only place that was open, we were the only place to go to. So that's why we have this example of all those cars. Um, I was in and out of that location today and at most there was four cars on each side, like multiple times throughout the day when I was going there, dropping off supplies, cups, lids, straws, you name it. Um, so I think that thinking that this is going to be an apples to apples comparison um, to that location, I was just looking at it more of from like a transaction standpoint, um, you know, that Bettendorf location, just where it's located, we, it, it still is a very high volume, high volume shop, 
But like Scott said earlier, taking consideration it's between the two high schools. Um, and that's also in a very, I guess, a, a wealthier part of town where like a lot of these kids, they just, they have that disposable income where they're able to buy these coffees, these energy drinks all throughout the day. Whereas, you know, we're looking to, you know, diverse and get into the West End now. And this is a viable option, not just for us, but also for this area. And we do know that we have a lot of people from the West End that are coming to our Brady Street location as well. So this will just, this will serve those more local um, neighbors who are gonna be, you know, patrons of our shop. And our peak hours, we don't believe, are going to interfere with the neighboring businesses as far as what the peak hour for a high school student is, is not a nine to five rush hour driver. Um, so we've got a little bit of, you know, there, there's not that overlap there. Um, and I mean, I, I feel like looking at this lot, um, and if anybody's familiar like with the business, you're gonna look at that lot and you're gonna say, this is like a, this would be the perfect place to put one of these because you know, it's kind of, it, it's away from a lot of other stuff and it's going to drive, you know, some more traffic to this area and it's going to keep some of the traffic, you know, on this side of town rather than going to the other locations. Um, concerns have been raised in the past about, you know, hey, Brady Street's very busy. Hey, Bettendorf's very busy. Well, our solution to those is to build more locations. Um, if you build a Disneyland down the street from Disneyland, you're gonna have two Disneylands that are half as busy. You're not gonna double the occupancy of those. And I feel like that's what we're trying to do here. So we're not gonna have another super busy third location. I believe we're gonna have three just thriving businesses in the area. Um, so, and if there's any questions on that, like I would love to field those. Okay. Oh, Angie. Um, so how? That's okay. Excuse me. How long does the car have to wait in line, you know, for the order and to actually get the drink? So when we first opened in 2016, our car turnover was about 60 seconds per vehicle because the operation inside were super fast and efficient. Um, as we've grown in popularity, the cars are now ordering multiple drinks, but we're also hiring more staff inside. So we went from crews of three to now crews of four and even five and even like having a runner now go out because we want to maximize the transactions per hour. Right now, I would say the average transaction, like when we're really busy and these orders are large, it's about a minute and a half to two minutes. Um, but you know, in the morning times when it's just a mom grabbing you know, coffee after she dropped her kids off to school, I mean, we're pumping that car out you know, in 60 seconds. So the line is moving and we're only spitting out you know, a car or two back into the road you know, every minute or two. And, you know, the other, the other problem that I, you know, when we were mapping this out is, okay, well, if we built this as just a one lane drive through, is that a solution? Well, no, because now you're giving all these cars just one window to go to, and we're only serving one at a time. Whereas if we're able to keep the design of how we have our business, we're able to divide that and have two lanes serving two vehicles simultaneously, dividing and conquer, and you know just getting everybody served that wants to buy the product from us. So when you say you have a runner, so like car number one that's at the window, if they're if they've got a large order, you can just have them pull up like at McDonald's, and then you bring it out. Is so that what we have is kind of similar to like Chick Fil A. If you've been there during their peak hours, they have somebody with a tablet that runs out and like starts kind of taking orders. Mm -hmm. During our peak times, we have had to incorporate something similar to that, where we have somebody come out because a lot of times our customers, this is their hundredth time there. They're, I mean, we have 90% return customers. Um, so most of the time, people know exactly what they want while they're in their car. We even have um, signage that has a QR code that if you just take a photo with it, it takes you to our menu online. So you're able to look at our menu while you're sitting there. So by the time you're car number three, which is, you know, would be right by the door there, you know, somebody can pop out and say, hey, do you know what you guys want? You know, we'll get it started for you. So by the time they get to the window, the transaction is simply paying and handing them the drinks. And it's a very speedy and efficient system. And it's something that we learned how to do during this pandemic when we had those days where, you know, we had 20 plus cars in line because 
I was getting phone calls. Hey, I've been in line for 30 minutes, blah, blah, blah. Like, hey, we're doing what we can, but we are like at capacity. We're doing, you know. And so as we, as we grow and we are a very young business, I mean, we're going to be turning five here in January. We are perfecting our art on a, on an art that you know, we're, is already pretty efficient. You know, we're shaving seconds off every transaction wherever we can just so that we can address this. Because the last thing I want is for there to be, uh, you know, a 13th, 14th car and they have to sit and wait when they want it now. This is a drive through business. They don't want to get out of their car. They want to get it and get back on their way to where they're headed. And, you know, this lot over here you know, on Locust on the West End, I mean, we believe that this is ideal application for it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. any, any other questions? I guess I have a, a, a comment that I want to. I'm all for safety. Mm -hmm. This location, I believe, is waiting for a lot of accidents to occur. Maybe not so much in the summertime, but in the wintertime. The car is sitting out there on Locust Street. All of a sudden, the car comes in where they have to go around your car that's, that's in the stacking lane and hits that car. That concerns me. Um, it's, Locust Street is really a high volume street where there's a lot of accidents there. Um, that's my comment about that. And another, why don't, I'm looking at your building here, why don't you, you only got two windows. Why don't you have a window for taking the money and a window giving the product on well, the other side? To address that, part of the experience of being a customer with Atomic is that you're at the window with the person who's preparing your drink. And unlike the robot system with Starbucks, you're able to make a last minute change whilst to your order. Like say, you know, the gal's making your coffee and you want a fat-free milk instead of the, you know, the whole milk or something like that. We can make that change right there because you're sitting there with us. When you place an order and then you have to like pull ahead and wait for that, what you just said, that's your expectation for like when you receive it. And like I said, part of like that customer experience is being at the window with your barista, having that conversation, that one-on-one -on -one feedback because that's why our brand has gotten so strong is because it's fun. It, it's fun to be a customer. It's a delicious product. And we don't want to take any of those elements away from that consumer, uh, from that, that customer experience. Don't you agree that you want this, the cars off the local street? I would 100%, yeah. I mean, I believe. And if you've got them in line waiting for their order at the window, they're out on that street. Well, but just like any other drive through like you're going you're gonna to have to get in a line somewhere. Then you have people leave. Well, the idea yeah. is to get them and to give them their product that they want right. and send them on their way. I agree with you. Yeah. Speed is the... Yeah, exactly. Okay. And so as long as we're able to do that, this is a, I mean, this is a static image right here. But, I mean, if you put this thing in motion, I mean, you're going to see cars coming and you're going to see cars going. And there's, I mean, as long as everybody's abiding by traffic rules, we there shouldn't be an issue. Do you understand why the city is concerned about the... Safety aspect? I do, and I have seen instances where there is no car stacking, you know, for other stuff. Um, I've also seen just, you know, down the street with the Mississippi uh, Fairgrounds, I mean, I've seen that stack to 280. I mean, I see that there are, there are instances where it becomes problematic, um, you know, and the reason why we've designed this and laid it out the way that we can is to facilitate the maximum amount of potential cars in that line. There's no guarantee that it's even going to be this busy in this location. I mean, we've, you know, we've done like our market research. We know that we have customers that are coming from pretty much all over the Quad Cities to our two existing locations. Um, we just, we need another viable option so that they're not all super busy because the only way to address this problem is to build more locations so that they're not have the same car stacking because you put another coffee shop somewhere else and yeah, they're going to, they're going to have cars, but they're not being held to the standard that there's going to be, you know, 20, 30 vehicles in line. My final comment is you're a businessman. Obviously you want projections on this site. How many cars or how much business you're going to get? Is it above your veterinary location? I don't believe so. I feel like for, 
for us, if we were to look at a map and we were to put two red pins on our existing locations and then you continue to look at the map of the Quad Cities, we need to spread out instead of put them on top of each other. The West End, I think, is a, is going to be the next growing area. Um, they've already done a whole bunch of investment into Bettendorf. We have a Bettendorf location. I feel like the West End is this diamond in the rough now that like there's going to be development around us. And if we're you know, bringing traffic to the West End, I think there's going to be more opportunities for developers to be like, hey, we need to get on this action too. And who knows, maybe one day Locust becomes, instead of a three lane, maybe a five lane. You know, that it might be in the cards someday, and then it just makes it safer for everyone. But given what we're working with right now, we believe that this is a viable option. And, you know, if we need to go back and add some sort of other safety measures or, you know, talk about, you know, what can we do for signage? What can we do for striping? What can we do, you know, to communicate with the customers, to communicate with the drivers? Um, you were all for that. Can I ask Scott to go to the overall uh, site plan that shows the other buildings in the location? If you look at that uh, site plan, you can see that that parking lot that's shared with all this development has two entrances. Theoretically, we could stack cars along the north side of that parking lot and not have anyone go into Locust Street. Yeah, I, once I get a chance to speak, I, I will address that, but you can continue for now. So, so if you look at the stacking in comparison to something like Brady, where they can wrap around that parking lot, and we have the shared lane that goes to the south, theoretically we could get to 37 cars without a car on Locust. Scott, would they have to get permission from the adjacent uh, landowners there for them to stack like that? Uh, this is Scott Cope's planning. Um, that is correct. Uh, we originally, originally asked for some traffic information from the petitioner. They gave us um, just about what they gave us the second time. It wasn't enough. We asked for more detailed information. Uh, we specifically asked for what effect would this have on adjacent property, and is there, do they have the rights to have vehicles stacking on property that they do not own? Um, those businesses to the east there, everybody parking in their parking lot is going to have to walk through standing traffic to get to the building. Now, there's a, a children's use in that westernmost building. So you're going to have children going through a line of, of standing people that are in a drive through. Um, they have no permission to do so. Um, additionally, that shared access drive, it's a, an access drive. It's not, once you have standing vehicles in it, it doesn't have access anymore. Um, additionally, Gary pointed out that they're going to they're going to make the lines uh, equal, so they're not going to go through the east lane and stack all the way to that far driveway because if you see a line that's got 30 cars in it, you're going to go to a line with four cars in it. So there's no way that they can stop it from backing up onto Locust Street by using the other lane. Um, and so these are some pretty serious concerns. Um, they never mentioned anywhere in their request that they were going to be utilizing adjacent property for stacking. Um, as Jonathan stated, the, proposed, the proposal is just for this site. Um, they didn't include anything on these other sites. They, they didn't mention it. And we asked for it, and they ignored the information that we sent them. They did not respond. Um, my statement was, what effect will this have on adjacent parking lot and does that property owner know what might be in store if this is built you know and we also verbally I asked him I said do you have agreements to have utilized this adjacent parking and I had no answer for that either so there's a lot of concerns here um, you know for one we can't we can't approve something on somebody else's property the zoning board doesn't have the authority to approve things on someone else's property. Um, we are aware that you cannot approve something on someone else's property. That's why we gave you the information that is pertinent to our piece of property. What we have outlined is the most common case of business this is going to have. We 
we can't predict a worse worse case scenario than a pandemic and 37 cars stacking there. It doesn't happen. That I, I do have a most, question of the petitioner. I mean, so Gary has told me that at the atomic site on, and Gary, you can confirm this or not, but Gary has told me that when the atomic site on North Brady was going on, uh, there was cars backed up onto Brady um, for a number of days, and the city got complaints about it, and the city went to the owner, and yes, the owner did help work out the situation, but the owner was aware that there were vehicles stacked on Brady Street blocking traffic, and they did nothing until they were told to fix the situation. So I, I don't know how much faith I have in the owner to do what's right. Um, do you know what year that was? Uh, Gary, I don't know if you know the year for that. Um, oh, at least three years ago. I mean, they weren't theoretically blocking traffic. They were pulled off to the side on the shoulder. They weren't in the waiting in the lane, you know, the through lane. But still, that's not desirable on Brady. And I 100% agree. Um, you know, we did we did talk with the city traffic and you know they're saying hey like we have an issue here and we ended up getting the whole parking lot like restriped to facilitate and bring those cars into the parking lot where they were going to be protected and to this day it's that's still the case so as we're you know facing these issues like we're we're doing everything that we can to be diligent to like to be safe because i i don't want a car standing in the street i don't want to have somebody get rear-ended you know, by a fast traveler that's not paying attention. I mean, you know, and for the most part, a lot of the drivers, some of these are going to be new drivers. If, you know, if I thought that we're going to be building something that's going to be problematic and have car accidents, you know, this wouldn't have been a site that we would put our eyes on. Um, we just, I, I truly don't believe that this is going to be as busy as the other locations. Um, you know, my goal is to just at any get at every moment have a car at the window because then I'm serving at my capacity. But as far as getting everybody queued up and waiting, I just I don't see that happening here in the West End. And I'm hoping that, you know, that this will be location number three. And I hope that when we can do it like a location number four and a number five, you know, we're not being we're not using, you know, numbers like, you know, 20 and 30 cars in line just because I, I don't think that that's something that's going to happen over time. And do you, do you want to talk about the, the neighbor? I have a commissioner's deck. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, if I can ask the petitioner and then maybe also um, to Gary from the traffic online, um, maybe slightly different topic. Um, most everything at the sites to the east, right? The high school um, fairgrounds during that season, most of the city. Yeah. Um, some to the west, and then, of course, some people coming in from bluegrass, Walcott, whatever. How concerned are you? Have you taken into consideration, and has the city traffic uh, looked at stacking up onto Locust Street because they're not able to turn left into the parking lot, not to mention stacking up in the lot, but stacking up before you can even get into the lot because most everyone's going to have to be turning left into the parking lot. And it, I believe there's a left-hand turn. Well, sure there is. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, there's there's a lot of, there's a two-way left turn lane there, so there's a decent amount of stacking for that. And there should be some gaps to turn left. Uh, there's a signal at Emerald a little west of there, yeah. which will create gaps to turn left. Okay. Gary, I just have one question. This is uh, Jim Meistroffer. Are you concerned a lot about the safety and the accident probability? Gary, I think that was a question for you. Are you talking to me or? Yes, yeah, I'm talking to you. Are you concerned about um, the, the, the safety aspect and the accident probability on the traffic coming on? Um, uh, probably more the congestion than anything else, because if one person is waiting on Locust to turn right, uh, you know, then people are going to be going around it in the left turn lane, and that's that's not good. 
Um, you know, we, we don't want anybody waiting on Locust. Now, if there's a few waiting in the left turn lane, waiting for their chance to turn left, that's probably not that big a deal because they're, they're out of the way in the left turn lane. But, but waiting in the right lane, you know, which is the through lane, you know, could cause congestion, especially, you know, if it's 730 in the morning or whatever. Um, you know, we want those people to be out, you know, off the road and into that parking lot as soon as possible. And that's really one of my biggest concerns. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. Any other? Oh, it'll be just a minute. <laughs> hey, Gary, this is Dan Darling again. Is there any, and of course, I don't know who would bear the expense, probably the, the petitioners, but is there ability to, put, to put in a right turn lane into the parking lot? Um, I suppose. I mean, I don't know who would pay for it, but, uh, you know, there, I think there's room to put a right turn lane in. I mean, we've got them at other intersections along West Locust. All right, just thought. Come on up, Jerry. You want to give us your name? Well, the COVID didn't put me under, Jim. I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Jeff Hoyer. I'm a commercial real estate broker. I have uh, represented this property, all the properties around there, for 17 years. So just to kind of premise what I'm up here for a uh, couple of inaccuracies I'd like to explain <clears throat> lot number one has already been purchased by this petitioner the west lot that you're talking about is owned by um, three different entities and they also own lot number three and four that are in the south side of that three is directly behind it four is behind more of the uh, the fairway plaza. <clears throat> uh, as far as, and I'll do it right off the top of my head, the, and I'm not a traffic engineer, Gary, so um, there is an easement uh, for storm sewer and utilities. I believe it's like 15 foot by 15 foot. It's on the hard corner. Well, actually, you can see it in that uh, diagram there. So a right turn into that, I don't know if that would be possible or not. A right turn lane. Okay. I'm just, yeah, there's probably room to do that. I just, uh, yeah, I don't know all the details about yeah, I know. You know, what you're talking about. Though. I know, Gary. I know. Uh, as far as um, uh, there was some mention about uh, uh, the parking lot. Uh, the, this development was done back in 1999. Uh, all these lots, uh, it's actually three different parcels. Uh, the main parcel that we're talking about is with the L-shaped building there you see in the south part of that picture. That is a, a office space, two tenants, one predominantly is Iowa Child Support Recovery. There are no children there. It's all office. It's all for payment of child support. I'm not sure what the other smaller, it's 11,000 square foot building roughly. I actually sold this whole building uh, about seven, eight years ago. The, the one little L-shaped wing on it, I don't know who the tenant is at this point in time, but it's, it's only like two or 3,000 feet of the 11. These parking lot that you're talking about is for lot number one also. It's not owned by them, but it is part of the development for the last, since 1999. So as far as utilizing that, I don't know what they want to do or get a hold of or, or whatever. I can help them out in that regard, uh, but they very well have the rights of using that parking lot. As far as the um, tenancy the, it, right now with the child support recovery, very few people, and this is pre-COVID. Uh, very few parking spaces are utilized there. I don't know the exact amount, but approximately six, 10 cars are parked there maximum because of the size of the building and how they utilize the building. They can do what they want as far as coming in, coming out of that. 
there, that is not an issue. You mentioned uh, something about, uh, let's see, what would be, uh, the speculation of, of this business. Uh, they've, met, they've met all the, the requirements by the ordinance. And I, I think it's kind of prejudicial when you say, okay, because you're atomic, you have to have X amount of uh, car spaces. But if you were just a regular ABC coffee, well, you can go four. The ordinance says four. So I don't know how you're going to look at that, but that's your decisions on how you go forward. Are there any questions as far as the real estate's concerned? Jeff, you mentioned that they have access to that parking lot to the east. How is how is that possible? Aren't those two different lots? There's actually that actually was on the actual is this Tom? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was actually yep. part of Ingram Cousins and uh, Eckstein development. Uh, lot number two was basically the, all of the fairway plaza. Lot one is a long strip. Lot three is the back lot. Lot four is a back, and they're all flag lots for three and four. But the utilization of that parking lot that's in the front of child support recovery, that specific parcel is also being able to be used by lot number one. It's part of the development. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Questions? I don't have a question. I just have a statement that the the code minimums are for stacking. It doesn't mean that the city can't require more when there's safety issues. Well, I won't go into that, but that originally was uh, zone C2. You know, on the rewrite, they redid it to C1, which I opposed them doing that. That's another different discussion, and it will be taken care of here shortly. I think you ought to be really look at what you've done with the rewrite, because a lot of these ZBA meetings are going to be part of that rewrite Wait, problem. Right Discussing the, the terms the, of the code is inappropriate well, for right now. Well, I'm talking about the point C of order, Chairman. Yes, I'm talking about code or for C2, C1 versus for this property. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other discussions from any of the applicants or the? Any questions from the board? No. Okay. Does anyone in the audience want to speak in favor of this request? I can say something. Okay, Want to give us your name, please? Hi, my name is uh, Tuvi Mendel. Uh, I just uh, wanted to just briefly reiterate what was already mentioned that uh, I think that the examples that are being taken today are the unusual and not the norm. You know, we usually say in medicine, if you hear hooves, don't assume zebras, assume horses. And in this particular case, we're utilizing a, an exceptionally abnormal number of cars that just happen to be there as a result of uh, the circumstances that we're living through today that were reported and subsequently were uh, addressed by the police or wherever to come and look at it, and it's not the norm. I mean, if we look at exactly what other uh, coffee shops or drive through services are going to go through, it's going to be the same exact thing, and, and nobody's going to be able to do anything on the west side of town. If you're talking about right-hand turn to get into it or left-hand turn to get into it, it doesn't matter what you put in there, everybody's going to have the same problem, getting in, getting out, so it doesn't matter if it's a coffee shop or if it's a Wendy's or if it's a Chick-fil-A, which I see constantly having issues with traffic. I mean, there's 
the occasional abnormal rare occasions that you might have some unusual traffic which we can accommodate with the flow and people have common sense you can assume that people don't understand that if there's significant amount of cars they're not going to stop in the middle of the street they're going to either continue to go and uh i usually sometimes drive by and i see a long line and i i continue to drive i don't stop because you don't just say okay fine let me stop in the middle of the street i mean there's some common sense involved too and um and i think that uh as peter said this is a much slower area it's not as congested uh i wanted to mention that uh, bendorf is not only bendorf to high school it's also scott community college that's right there so you're dealing as and you mentioned correctly that there's not a lot going on on the west side most of the stuff is on the east side so everything to the west of it is pretty undeveloped and there's not much going on so we do believe that the traffic is going to be fairly low it's not going to be as congested it's going to be divided between the other two locations and it's only going to benefit the community it's going to benefit the community it's going to promote the area it's going to support taxes it's going to bring more businesses over there and there's other businesses down the street to the east of it that requires you know drive through and coming into parking lots and things like that so the public has common sense they don't just stop in the middle of the street if, if there's a significant amount of traffic and to assume that there's going to be 37 cars every day i think it's it's not correct i think we need to look at it realistically and say that normal average use is more than adequately supported by the plans that we presented today Thank you very much. Thank you. Does anybody in the audience want to speak opposed to this request? I see none. Applicant, um, no matter if there's three or four, do um, you have any final comments? I'm good. Okay. There's a person that's out there, Jonathan, is he still with us? Yeah, I agree with Tubi. You have to plan on the normal rather than the abnormal. <clears throat> board, board discussion. Do they have any board discussion? Tom, you got any discussion? Uh, nothing for me, Jim. Okay. Excellent. Um, so do they, Scott, or I'm just, just among ourselves? Or can yeah. I ask that question? Or? You can ask that question, yeah. Are Go they ahead. able to use that parking lot or is, or? Um, so that's a change to their, they didn't put that in their application. Um, so if they want to change their application, they can. If they do that, they will need to have written documents stating that they can utilize that parking and that if cars are parked in a drive aisle inhibiting use of the rest of the parking lot um, I guess the owner can waive his rights to have a functioning parking lot um, but that we would need to see something in writing to allow um, use of adjacent properties for this use um, now I have one further question um, for the petitioner. Um, <laughs> the owner's fine. Um, and I agree with you know, Dr. Mendel as far as looking for most, most likely in my, in my career, um, we, we plan for two courses of action, um, enemy action of most likely and then also most dangerous. So speaking of the most dangerous side, um, are there any contingencies for those abnormal days to to manage traffic flow? What would the contingency plan be for that? Have you put any thought into that? Do you want me to stand up or? Yeah, I'll yeah. speak from the point. Okay, we'll come back up. All right, again, Peter Shalasi, owner operator of Atomic. Um, so while we've experienced some of this, these problems with like our Brady Street location, just to use as an example, when it did, become more than like we thought we were going to be able to handle. Um, we did hire off-duty police officers to come and direct traffic and to keep the line orderly because you know, there was an, a, 
there was a long line like those it was that those weeks of late spring uh, particularly may right when like we were at like the the height of all this and all of our competitors decided to shut their doors um you know when we if we experience an isolated incident again um you know and if written permission or you know consent of utilizing you know the parking lot and stuff like that like we can you know have somebody out there directing traffic if and when like that should occur um you know, I, I, I would hate to think that somebody's just going to park their car in the middle of Locust trying to get in when there's a parking lot that can facilitate the overflow that goes beyond the specs of the car stacking that we've presented. You know, Peter, people are very impatient. They're sitting in that line. All of a sudden, they see five or six or seven cars. And they don't want to wait. So then they pull out. And then the car is coming, and you have an accident. Well, I mean, if I need to put a sign that says look yeah. both ways before entering on the Locust, we can do that. Um, and if somebody's going to pull out a line because they don't want to wait, then I'm hoping that maybe they're going to go up to 47th and Brady Street or maybe mm -hmm. on to Ridgepoint and Bettendorf and go to one of my other locations. Because um, if this one's busy, that means those two probably are dead. Well, I hope they're busy. I, I mean, I, I, this is wishful thinking. I mean, I, you guys are giving me way more credit than I deserve for running a very successful business, um, you know, anticipating that we're going to be that busy well, in this location. Peter, I think all of us have seen lines at coffee places. And yeah. Fun. And, you know, also keep in consideration that, you know, there's no barriers to entry in this industry. And I'm constantly hearing about another competitor popping up, you know, down the street from me on Brady Street or you know, over near Bettendorf. I mean, there's going to be more competition, which only means that our customer base is going to have more options and more places to go to. And eventually, like, my, my line isn't going to be this long line that's problematic now. Um, you know, I'm hoping that the West End becomes a destination for commerce. Um, people are going to come to Atomic or they're going to come to, you know, wherever is, like, you know, convenient for them in the area. I just want to make sure that I'm always a viable option wherever somebody who wants coffee or an energy drink in the Quad Cities, they, if they want to come to me, awesome. I want you in my line, and I want to get you back on your way as fast as you can. If you don't want to go to me, then, you know, you're going to be in somebody else's line if they have one. Um, you know, it's just, that's how it's going to be. Thank you. All right. Any further board discussion? Um, as staff, I would, I would like to ask Gary a question about, um, I guess the first question would be um, about the atomic on North Brady. Um, the first time there was issues with that, of uh, cars being in the, the shoulder of the road, um, that was well before COVID, is that correct? Uh, yeah, well, first of all, I want to correct myself. Uh, I looked up the volume. It's closer to 10,000 on Locus, not 12,000, not not a big deal, but I just want to set, set the record straight there. Um, the issue with the Brady Street, that was long. That was years ago. Okay. And uh, I think they did a good job of correcting that with their internal uh, traffic control, the way they set it up. So it's, it's not an issue anymore. Right. Right? They did a really good job with that, right. I thought. Right. So they utilized the existing drive aisles and other parking lots of that development for the handling. Right, the yeah, they... They did some pavement markings, I believe, and coned it off, and um, it has okay. not been an issue since then. So okay. it, it, it's working fine. And I, I do have a question, Gary, about um, planning for you know normal volumes versus planning for peak demand and being able to accommodate peak demand. How does your profession typically handle that? I mean, you don't. Yeah, you know, I mean, when we design, let's say, a road, we're not designing for uh, you know Black Friday traffic or something like that. It's the normal. It's a, you know, it's, it's above normal, of course, you know, you design for, so it's hard to tell exactly what kind of traffic, you know, this is going to generate on a, on a typical day. Um, you know, there's, I mean, I'm convinced there's going to be some days where it's going to spill out. I mean, it's just, it's, it's bound to happen. I'm not saying it's going to happen every day, but, you know, we'll, we'll put some signs on Locust about not waiting on Locust and uh, hopefully they get into the parking lot and uh, something can be worked out there and, you know, if it works out like it does on Brady, then, then everything will be fine. Right. 
Would it, would it be possible for me to ask a question of Gary? Yeah. Um, Go ahead. Gary, the, the aerial photos that Scott used to count on Brady, do you know when those were taken? I think that was about last year. It might have been last spring, so almost two years ago. There have, I mean, there happened to be 27 cars in line, and I mean, that's just one snapshot in history. We have, you know, it was probably, I don't know what it does on a typical day, but uh, in, in, uh, to be fair, though, Brady is much, much busier street than West Locust, so, you know, it's a little bit of apples and oranges there. Okay, thank you. Got any further uh, yeah, Gary, if, should this be tabled, um, would you want more detailed information for a traffic study, or or is that not something you you would need? Um, I don't know if I need that. It doesn't, I don't know, it's not up to, it's not up to me. You, whatever you guys decide is fine. I guess I'd ask for a motion to approve. I'll make a motion to approve. Can I get a second? Second. Any further board discussion? Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to um, recommend that we table this for some uh, further study on the traffic and also for the parking lot usage. There's a motion on the table to approve. Okay. So uh, we just have to let that motion either rescind that motion or let it fail. Okay. I think it, let it fail. Well, let me, Tom, can you rescind your motion? I can rescind my, sure, I'll rescind my motion. Okay. Motion to rescind. And now you would make your motion to table. Okay. All right, motion to table. Can I have a second? Second. Do we need a roll call, Scott? Um, does, the board... uh, does the board have any comments on the tabling and what the board may be looking for. Yeah, we're looking yeah, I, I guess, yeah I'm, I'm a little confused. Yeah. If we table this motion, what are what are we asking the petitioner to come back with? Are we are we looking for um, information on the adjacent lot and and their ability to use that and and what what the traffic flow might look like, what the stack, how that might affect the stacking? Or is that what we're looking for? Yeah, I think you hit that right on the right on the nail head. Some permission permission to use that adjacent lot. Scott, will the city do the traffic uh, study, or the, the petitioner? It, it would be the petitioner's okay. responsibility to do a traffic study. Um, okay. So, with this tabling, staff will have to ask the petitioner to to resubmit his request because his request doesn't state. Uh, utilization of other properties and that we don't have we'd also with that new request we would ask for um, agreements um, to um, use the property and but we would also ask that that agreement be clear on exactly which part of the property would be used and we want to make it clear that the adjacent property owner is, understands where these vehicles might be stacking and uh, so they can understand what the implication might be on their business. And perhaps even flow, like the, the flow that you have out on Brady through the parking lot, and then you, know, you got a, a break where the driveway is and all that. So. so will this be a new application? Uh, we can keep it kind of under this request, but it, right. they need to change the, what they're requesting formally. Okay. But there is no fee for that? No. Okay. We would just ask that they revise this one provide us what their new request is. I mean, it's it's not this, a different application. It's the same application, but they, they've changed what they're asking for. So we would want that in writing and in um, those agreements, as I mentioned. Okay. 
So we need a vote on the tabling. Uh, roll call. Or we can do voice vote. Voice vote's fine. Okay. All in favor? All in favor? Aye. 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 Yes. Okay. So you'll, uh, you'll set up a meeting time the next time? Yeah, so the, the, the case has been, the, the request has been tabled, and we will put this forward on the next agenda if, if everything's in order at that time. What do we do about request B and C? Do we table that too, or do we have to? Yeah, we can officially table those as well. Okay. Do we need a, do I have to read? Yeah, I would, I would make a motion to table both of them, and then okay. we can do a voice vote on it. I'll get a motion table B and C. A motion to table B and C to be considered with the other motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So your request has been tabled, and uh, you'll get together with Scott, and we'll set up a date that uh, it comes in front of our board. All right. Okay, Peter. All right. Okay. Well, thank you for your time. Okay. Well, thank you for coming. Right. Okay. Well, we have one more item, other business, election of a chairman and vice chairman. So... Have any nominations? I would recommend that we give a, a pause for a few minutes to let the uh, okay. the the, uh, the audience clear out. Right. Thank you for coming. Okay, it's up to you guys what you want to do. Now, just for those, I mean, a lot of you are new to the board. Um, you can discuss uh, if you want to put someone forward as a recommendation. You can talk about it, um, or you can just go to a motion. Uh, we need to uh, elect first the chairman and then secondly a vice chair. Just do my nominee. <laughs> I'm not new. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll second that. Was, was your mic on? No, it's okay. on now. I nominate Jim as the uh, chairperson. Okay. Uh, so this is going to be a roll call vote on vice, or sorry, chairman. It's first by Lebeck and second by Darlin. Um, uh, I'll say uh, Quinn. Uh, yes. And Darlin. Yes. And layback? Yes. Okay, motion carries. And so now we need the vice chair. I would, uh, oh, I can't, I can't, I'm sorry. Somebody Can you not? Can I nominate somebody, Scott? You know, I, yeah. I think you can, because it's not, you're not, yeah, I think you could. And the other thing is, I just, I want to clarify, we have four members out there at the moment, correct? Lynn, you're not here? Okay, thank you. I nominate uh, Angela as vice president. <laughs> you're used to it. <laughs> I'll second. I'll, I'll second, too. Okay, uh, voice vote. Yes, for me. You want, it, you want it not a voice vote? Yeah. The voice vote for uh, the vice chair. Yes. Uh, yes, yes, for okay. me. Yes, for me. All right, thank you. So we have the, we have the, election, of, we have the election of officers completed. Um, so if you want to, you can end the discussion unless you want to discuss other issues related to election of officers. I think, you know, as chairman... I always do this once a year. I always say thank you to the staff. We couldn't do it without you, especially you, Scott and Mallory, and you're the new lady here. So I appreciate you, but uh, for me, thank you. You keep me straight, 
and I try to do my best, and you guys always get my best. Well, thank you, but we can't do it without you either because we definitely need uh, five volunteers for this high paying job. <laughs> Laura, do you want to introduce yourself? Talk about your experience with the city? Sure. Um, yeah, so um, my name is Laura Berkeley. I am the development and planning administrator uh, for the city of Davenport. Um, that's a, a newer position uh, with the city. It started in June. Um, at when the uh, city transitioned planning and zoning under a new department called the Development and Neighborhood Services. Uh, so we are now under department with our, our building and code enforcement and, um, and parking um, officials. Um, and part of that is to have a more comprehensive and better communication uh, as, a, as a unit uh, for development. Uh, so I have been with the city for um, about three and a half years. I came from economic development um, in community planning and economic development. Um, however, before that, I spent eight and a half years as a regional planner at Bi-State Regional Commission um, doing um, anything from solid waste management to hazard, uh, um, hazardous event planning and comprehensive land use plans. Prior to that, I was actually here at, as, a, as a planner for two and a half years as a planner one, uh, although I, I, I mostly did code enforcement and historic preservation commission. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Glad to be here. Well, I make a motion that we adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Adjourn. Aye. Thanks for coming, Tom. See y'all. Yep, we'll see you at the next meeting. January? January. Sounds good. Have a good night. Yeah, there's not another one. January.